Hi, Nick Vince here. This week on The Chattering Hour, I'm joined by a guest from season one, Daniel Roebuck. Then he was very excited about a project he couldn't really talk about. Now it's released and out in the world, he plays Grandpa in Rob Zombie's The Monsters. Daniel gives a very honest interview about that experience. Up next on The Chattering Hour with Daniel Roebuck. And we're back with Daniel Roebuck. We're also joined by his stepdaughter, Julia, who turns the tables on me just a little bit. Let's get to it. Daniel, thank you very much indeed for joining me again after what is two years? I think two years, yeah. Yeah. Look at us. We've we both got two years better looking. <laughs> Although I wanted to let my... I, I, I threatened to let my beard grow, and I haven't I haven't done it yet. <laughs> uh, we'll fake it. <laughs> oh that would be so much easier man easier to manage than this it's like oh, spend yeah. all my life doing this just to see if i can that's right it, it, yeah is it straight now i'm not i'm never quite sure and it just annoys me and then there's all the little twiddly well, heads. and it's like the genius of it is from an actor's point of view now you understand why ming the merciless or <laughs> if karloff was where they were always like yes yes dear boy <laughs> you know they always use the beard as a prop. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So now the last time we talked, there was a project you weren't able to talk about, which oh, we are now going to talk about, and that's the monsters. So how did the monsters, the monsters, da, 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 I mustn't sing the theme tune, probably copyright infringement. No, you can, I think it's okay. But I've got the, I, ever since I knew I've got this happening today, I was like, I've just got the earworm of the monsters. Oh, yeah, it doesn't go away. No. But it's okay, because it's part of that movie, and we're promoting the movie. So if we want to go, da, 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 no, no one can stop us. No, no, da, 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 da. As long as we don't go, da, 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 yeah. da, 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 da. <laughs> which people do, and I'm like, ah, that's a different thing. So when did you first see the monsters? Well, the monsters are literally as old as I am. They were on from 64 and 65, which means they shot them in 63, and I was born in 63. So they're literally the same age as I am. My first memory of any of that stuff, I'm always intrigued when people say, oh, I remember when I was two. I don't hard to remember when you were two, I think. But I do remember when I was five or six, that was a a big deal for my brother and I to sit down and watch the monsters. Um, so that would have been in reruns, obviously, because we'd find them uh, back in America. The shows would go off and then that show found not a nighttime rerun slot, but they programmed it for kids. So it was a daytime. So you'd come home from school after dark shadows, about four 30, you might catch the monsters on TV. Yeah, it's interesting. I think I was trying to remember. So in the UK, when they were broadcasting it in the 60s, there were literally just two channels. There was the BBC and then there was the commercial channel. Oh. My, mother, my mother didn't like the idea of a commercial channel. <laughs> she had only watched the BBC. And the it was BBC... like, Nicholas, you need to learn everything about the making of goat cheese that's <laughs> necessary for your growth. I don't know if that's how your mother sounded. No, no, not at all, funny enough. <laughs> but I do remember that basically if I wanted to watch the other, you know, the Adams family, then I had to go to my neighbor's house to watch the Adams family. Right. But we yeah. But the I progressive the progressive neighbors next door. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what was your favorite character when you first started watching? The TV well, series. It'd be, I would be lying if I said I was always drawn to Grandpa. Look, Herman was Fred. Fred Gwynn was so perfect as Herman, uh, and every kid identified with Herman because Herman was like you. Mm. 
But then there was an odd, I've thought about it a lot, Nicholas. We all identified with Herman because he was like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to, you know, he was like a big baby. But I think about it now when, when you look at people say, were you an Adams Family kid or a Munsters kid? To me, we all wanted the Andy Griffith show dad to be our dad. But in reality, our dads were closer to Herman Munster than Andy of Mayberry. Because like the Robux, I mean, this is no great confession. We were a very, we were a lower middle class family. Um, I went to a Catholic school and a lot of the kids in the Catholic school were came from a better background. Right. They had bigger houses, nicer houses, cleaner houses. My mother wasn't, you know, was was not Mrs. Beaver when it came to that kind of stuff. She was kind of a free thinker. So the house was always a little sloppy, um, but lived in. And uh, my father at times was dad. And then at other times... He would wrestle with you and he'd, uh, you know, we'd go to amusement parks. We my, we got to live, my father never had a good childhood. So we got to live his second childhood with him. So this is a long way around to say that Herman Munster was most like, and the Munsters <clears throat> were most like us. Mm. We were happy to be who we were, but we were not exactly like, you know, when I go over, I remember going to Pete Margie's house. I played Little League with Pete. I wonder how he's doing. Uh, I remember going to his house where the rich people lived and he had art on the wall. On the wall were paintings. And I just, I thought, my God, it's like a museum here. These people are so rich they can afford paintings. I didn't know that anybody could afford paintings. Like It wasn't like, they weren't like, you know, it wasn't like a Picasso. It was just like a painting. Yeah. Who even knows if it was a real painting? But to me, I was like, we didn't have paintings on the wall in our house. Nothing like that. Right, right, right. So did you, I mean, do you remember kind of, so you're watching it with your brother. Do you remember acting it out at all? Oh, yeah. It was always, you You, you go that way and, I, and I'll go this way. I'm an idiot. Idiot. So... <laughs> You know, once then, what what developed soon after was we were all then at that point in our lives when we could conceptualize comedy, physical comedy, and then vocal comedy. Uh, and this I love when I we get to talk to actors about this kind of stuff. When we were introduced to Abbott and Costello and their, their relationship was about verbal combat, and we were uh, introduced to the Three Stooges, and their relationship was generally, generally speaking, about physical combat. And then, then you started realizing that the Munsters were a comedy team. And Avon De Carlo is also great, but you're watching Herman and Grandpa. Yeah, Herman, let's, come here, idiot, moron. You know, sometimes they love each other. Sometimes they hate each other. Sometimes they're scheming. Sometimes they're painting the, the line down the middle of the house. <clears throat> so you started appreciating them as a comedy team. And my brother and I were all about laughing. Like kids. I think this is, we've screwed up our kids today. Not me. My kids weren't allowed to think about things that they shouldn't have thought about. But we've weighed on our children politics and sexuality and all this nonsense that takes them away from just being a kid who could sit down and watch comedy or watch a cartoon or watch Bugs Bunny or whatever you guys watch there. Like, all we had to do is be a kid. We didn't have to negotiate anything. We didn't have to, we didn't have to believe in anything. All we had to believe in was mom and dad were in charge. And when they said, be home, be home. And don't talk to strangers and go have a good life. It's it's interesting. I think, funnily enough, one of the things I used to watch was Laurel and Hardy. They used to play them on Saturday mornings before we had proper kids TV. They just used to play Laurel and Hardy. And I remember growing up on Laurel and Hardy films. Um, you would also, as an actor, then be taking in all of that, the, the cues of, their, their body language and how, how, how they moved and and e like the, the specific yeah. stuff like that or the, the non-specific stuff like 
you know, or you learn how to do a, you know, a side take and you knew how to push a laugh by turning your body a certain way. Or well, the double do. Yeah. Double do. Yeah. And yeah. People could go to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts or they could go to the actor's gang or they could go to whatever. I learned all of my acting from watching Tony Randall, Abbott and Costello, Jackie Gleason, Art Carn. Like those guys were, I just took in how they moved. And that's how I became the, and to, to and then especially in this thing we're talking about, mm-hmm. Nicholas, Al Lewis, like yes. spending my time watching Al Lewis. So when it became time to be like him, I knew where my hands had to be. And I knew where my voice had to be. <clears throat> I knew how my body had to stand. My feet were always, if you watch the movie, my feet are always pointed out, uh, which is something I think he did to straighten his back. Did you ever get to meet him? I did. I've In an incredible life that I've led, uh, I could say Fred Gwynn and I were friends. Al Lewis and I were friendly acquaintances. He knew me. I knew him. I knew his wife. His wife, by the way, let me pitch uh, her book. Uh, his wife, Karen Lewis, wrote a book called I Married a Monster, My Life My Life with Grandpa Al Lewis. A terrific book and a great book for um, people who love the monsters, but also a great book for people who love love and a great book for theatrical people and actors because it's their journey, you know, through that prism of she was an actress too and how they fell in love in a play and then what the actor's life is as we get older and and how al if he wasn't getting acting jobs was never not busy you know he ran for office he was very you know very political very political uh in his uh views on the world and wanted the world to adjust to his politics Ah, now you mentioned Fred Gwynn. How did you meet Fred Gwynn? Well, we, we, we did a movie together. Can you imagine what a great, we did a movie called Disorganized Crime. So we spent, well, two months, eight, eight weeks together in uh, Hamilton, Montana, where nobody could go. We were all together all the time. We didn't live in the same hotel. We all had a different house thing. We rent it. Um, and it's a great, silly movie. It's a Disney movie where uh, we're the cops trying to figure out where the bank robbers are. So in reality, Fred and I literally only appear in one scene where they come into the scene, do something, drive out, and then we drive into the same scene without a cut, right? So one scene. But, you know, we were together every day. Uh, and uh, they were... They were they were the original actors because they got there uh, to the set the first day first. And then, you know, we would always shoot on the same set. So then they would leave and they'd say, okay, bring in the real good actors. And then me and Ed O'Neill were the real good actors or the really good actors. So that's what our chair back said, the really good actors. And those were the original actors. Uh, wow. I think. wow. Wow. So when did you learn that you were going to be playing Grant? Well, when did you first hear that Rob Zombie was going to be doing a reboot of the monsters? Nicholas, I heard both in the same moment. He, he had said he wanted to talk to me about a movie uh, that he was making. Uh, That's all he said. So we were driving. I could, you know, I hate to be so specific. It was uh, July 19th, probably about three 30 mountain time. When I was driving to my friend's wedding, we picked up a car in Chicago. Tammy sitting next to me wearing a Lily Munster shirt. Rob Zombie's name pops up on the car. You know, you're driving. Hello. Hey, hey, how you doing? Good, good, good. He goes, so I'm making a movie, The Munsters. Yes. And uh, and he said, I'm wondering if you would play the grandpa character. And I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, I, I said, I literally said, if this is some kind of joke, uh, I'm going to cry. Because, no, no, it's not a joke. And, uh, I mean, crazy. Wow. And then COVID came. We got postponed twice. Well, an actor starts thinking they're never going to do it. At some point, they're going to get to. They're going to just, you know, that's what happens. You know, 
Yeah. They like, we're doing it. We're doing it. We're doing it. Too many things. And then like, forget it. We're not doing it. But you, he kept it alive. Brilliant. When, so the phone call came, what, in 2019? 2019, Just July 19th. We didn't actually shoot until April. We went there in March. We shot April 2021. So nearly two years. Wow. Worse uh, for, for me, nearly two years of keeping a secret. How easy was that? So hard. My kids knew, my mom and dad knew, my brother knew, and uh, Tammy knew, of course, and my 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 buddy, John Lamana, who uh, I knew since first communion, right? So that's, I knew him since first, second grade. He's a huge fan like I am. Uh, and I, he's a Tom, former Tom. So I knew he could keep the secret. So I sat him down one day and told him, he was like, you know. But what's funny here, I got to pull up. Nicholas, when I was a little boy, um, <clears throat> I was uh, I was a clown in a circus. And uh, that clown, let me see if I can get this up here. Oh, was, wow. Uh, I was a vampire clown. A vampire clown. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so that was my, my routine. So imagine... That's when I'm 12 years old, and that's when I'm 58 years old. Oh, wow. Wow. Now, I know we all have a different version of our reality. Some of us say the universe. Some of us don't believe in a godly figure. I never, you know, how I how I believe. I don't expect other people to believe. But Rob Zombie, as we were hanging up, he said, he said, oh, Danny, just by the way, I'm going to send in the script. When you read the script, uh, there's no Eddie yet in the story. So the character is the Count. And, Nicholas, this was the name of the magician, the, the clown comedy magician of my youth. Oh, wow. Oh, it, it, this was just supposed to be, wasn't it? This Truly. Was... So imagine then when people were like, oh, you know, Rob Zombie only cast his friends. I was like, no, you idiot. God cast me in this part. And Rob Zombie was just, you know, I was put in front of him enough so he would recognize that I was the guy, I think. I don't know that Rob believes in what I believe either. Again, it doesn't matter. No. But you can't be a 12-year-old vampire clown named the Count and then become the Count, who's a funny vampire in the Munsters, and not think there's some, you know, connection in spiritual, universal way. You'd, uh, if I if I took that out of it, my ego would be so huge to think that I and I alone did it. Uh, I I'd be insane. Yeah, that's what I think. Where did you film? We shot in Budapest, Hungary. Have you ever shot there? No. Oh God, it's so it's so beautiful. But when we landed, it was shut down. You know, you we couldn't even. There was a curfew. Like that's I've I've never seen anything like that. The whole country curfew eight o'clock. You had to be in. You could have food delivered, and food delivery people mm -hmm. uh, and public works people were the only dispensation to to that situation. So we could get food delivered. Um, and we could stay in our hotel and we could work during the day. Um, so we did costume fittings and makeup tests. And every now and again, we went on location scouts. Like Rob was our dad and he'd get up in the morning and he'd go to work because we'd always have breakfast. You know, we'd have to get our nose swab because that was every 48 hours or whatever. We had to get a swab row and they would do that at 8 a.m. or 7 a.m. You'd be down there and you'd have your coffee and your, you know, your oatmeal with the boss and then he'd get out and go well i gotta go and he'd go to the to the office and we'd you know we'd be like okay come back I'll tell us what it's like out there you know because we could walk around but it was just weird after a month they opened up the restaurants but oddly you you could only eat outside but it was amazing the weather was gorgeous 
Uh, so I, I had my four favorite restaurants that I go to and they, we, we developed a middle ground language uh, in which I spoke enough of their language and they spoke enough of mine that I could order my food without onions. And that's so I, I didn't deviate from those places, but uh, we were never allowed. I was never allowed to eat in a restaurant. I could go in to get my food, but I couldn't eat in one. Even though of all those people in the country of Hungary, I was probably one of the 10 people who had been vaccinated. Uh, but my vaccination card didn't count in Hungary. Uh, yeah. Funny? yeah. So I could never go to a museum. And we were literally right across the street from the National Museum of Hungary. Uh -huh. So I couldn't go to any of the museums, any of the... I couldn't go to church. Once I found, I found that I could go into any church, that was good. Oh, okay. So I went to a lot of churches. Right, 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 right. So what was the atmosphere like on set? Oh, I mean, it was, you'll appreciate this, because you know how some movies are, but like, you know, what in reality, Hellraiser, I, I don't think I'm was a low-budget movie, right? I, well, this is really interesting, and this, I, this is something I only learned after 35, 36 years a couple of weekends ago. For years, I've said, oh, it was only $945,000 originally, then they added some more. But I was talking with Clark, with Clive Barker's archivist, Philip, and he said, actually, Nick, no, it's closer to $2 million. It was all, I know that's the story that's been told for years, it's but looking at all the numbers, yeah. So not a huge budget. But not a huge budget, but, not, but not, not like, you know, Sherlock Holmes. No. Like, well, you were making that, they were making Jeremy Brett's Sherlock Holmes. And in one episode, they were spending probably four million. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or whatever pound. So, you know, we made the monsters. What's astounding is Rob's budget wasn't huge. At one point it was they said it was forty million dollars. Well, it wasn't a tenth of that, maybe. I mean, so that's a lot of stuff to cram in, especially with a show, let's say like Hellraiser, where you have characters. I know your Cenobites weren't in the whole movie, but mm -hmm. imagine we had to be in full makeup in every shot. And then we all play multiple parts. So even some of the days we weren't, I wasn't grandpa, I still had a two hour makeup job, a three hour makeup job to become uh, like Ezra Mosier, uh, the other character I play. Right. Um, so it was a lower budget movie. What he, what it looks like. Zoran Popovic was our DP, a marvelous guy, a Serbian, uh, a Serbian uh, a DP, terrific. It looks great. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was, it was just not a big budget movie. I don't know why we're, you had a different question though. What was uh, the question? That really, what were the atmosphere like on set? Well, the atmosphere. So, so oh, that's where I was getting. Relevant. Yeah. So, so we didn't have, that's what I was getting at. We did. It was not a leisurely pace film, right? It was not like, let's say, the Fugitive, uh, where we shot for five and a half months. It was. It was. You know, you knock a scene out, and then you go. It was. You just would have to. So we were, because we shot the whole thing in thirty some days, thirty five maybe thirty four. That's not a a lot of time. When when I shoot a the movies I make, I shoot for 25 days yeah. and there's no makeup effects. There's no lightning. There's no anything. So, um, you know, we just, we had a great time, but there was not like, let's watch that take together and laugh at it. It was like, let's go. Yeah. 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 It was interesting. I think on Hellraiser, it was 28 days. I've got the number 28 or oh, that may be. Yeah, that yes, is that certainly Nightbreed would have been longer than that, but I think yeah, yeah, you Nightbreeds, well, right, because yeah, yeah. then they threw money at it. Yeah, yeah, but the Hellraiser they threw money at it, and then because we went back and did some reshoots. Um, so oh, can I, I? I just again, this is great actor actor stuff. When they did the reshoots, was it to put more Cenobites in? No, funnily enough, it, what they did was. What I clearly remember was that it was the appearance of Frank through the floorboards. Oh. So it was actually building up Frank 
coming up through the floorboards and that whole animatronic right. and the the you know the brain forming and and all, and all that stuff i think we only did about two or three days and i certainly i observed the the uh extra stuff um because i'd never really been on the film set uh when we were doing the principal photography and it's like i want to see how films are made yeah and, you want to watch yeah i want to watch i want to see how it's all done um so i think they did about three extra days uh, and it was mostly the animatronic stuff that they were doing, uh, working on. You see, I just saw Andrew Robinson at a show. Uh, what a, I love him. Amazing man. Yeah, yeah, great career. He beat me out of one of the key roles. Uh, but again, not not meant to be. Early in my life, uh, I think it was down to wire between me, him, and a third guy to play Liberace. That was back right after Liberace died, which would have been eighty. 788, 89. And uh, the reason I kind of, they did two two versions. The first one was done by the Liberace family. So Andy got to wear all of Lee Liberace's authentic clothing. It wasn't remade. It was Lee's clothing. Isn't that crazy? And he's great in it. I don't know if we can find it. I wonder if there's a piece of it on YouTube or anything. But yeah, think of that. And Andy Robinson as Lee Liberace. Wow. Wonderful. I'd never yeah. heard of that. I'd never yeah. heard about that. Oh, I shall ask him about it. I'm going to think I'm due to see him in February. So I should be. Oh, great. Ask him about it. Yeah, I should pick his. Tell him, tell him Robux still weeps, weeps <laughs> at night. I did get to play Jay Leno. I did get to play Gary Marshall. And then I got to play Grandpa Munster. So there's no complaining here. I'm just saying <laughs> yeah. I would have loved to have played Liberace too. Yeah. Yeah. Do um what okay so you're obviously very excited were you at all nervous about fan reaction because it's rebooting such a beloved tv series and that can go either way randomly as far as i can you're so right and i was so stupid that i didn't think anything of it i really thought i'm on the set watching jeff daniel phillips do such an amazing job as herman Mm. and sherry moon zombie doing an amazing job as lily and I know in the heart of my heart that I'm there because of a uh, greater purpose put me there. So the same thing is true of both of them. We're all exactly where we need to be. I wish people could understand this. If they did, our world would go so much better. Everyone's exactly where they need to be. Uh, that's the plan. You know, you may not like them there. Let's say your prime minister, you like or don't like. But they're there because that's where they needed to be at that moment for whatever reason that has nothing to do with you. So the minute you take yourself out of the center of the equation and realize you're part of a, a bigger deal, then you get a lot less angry about stuff. So I, it never occurred to me that people wouldn't like this movie. And they they hated it from the announcement. Of it. Uh, and I don't know if it's because they don't like rob and they they're you know i I, if you i think there's a weird jealousy of people that doesn't make any sense you know sherry moon zombie stars in all of rob's movies uh and that drives people crazy but uh mia farrow starred in all of woody allen's movies and it didn't drive anybody crazy like and i could go on and on and on hell I cast my dearest friends in the movies I make. I write the parts for them Mm. because when I'm working, if I'm shooting a movie in 26 days, or in this case, he had 30, 34. The last thing you want to do is have to negotiate an actor onto the set or to do a scene the way you wrote it or whatever. Right. So why does that drive people crazy? It's just the way it's done. It's strange. I, I I think it's like um, when people cover songs. If you have formed an emotional connection, you hear it in your head in a particular way. And I I do wonder if it's the moment you hear somebody else doing exactly the same lyric, exactly the same tune, but doing it differently. It just sounds inherently wrong. It doesn't and it's nothing to do with quality. 
it's just because we do get very fixed, although our minds are quite pliable in many ways and we're easily influenced as human beings, I do think we do get very set in our ways, sadly, particularly the older we get. Yeah, um, yeah. and that's the problem. I think a lot of the pushback on those monsters was coming from people our age mm. uh, who just went, went in with an, an axe to grind. I'll tell you who loves the movie. Every young person we've met, families love it. Uh, we're bringing the monsters to a new generation. So again, shame on the old those guys going. This movie is a debacle, or whatever, uh, because you they don't understand. They're going to be dead soon. You're going to. I'm going to be dead soon, and I mean soon. I don't mean tomorrow. I mean like when I'm 96 and I can still go to the bathroom on my own. Uh, but that's still soon in terms of time. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you know, like, so we're going to be gone. Who's going to bring the monsters to a new generation? Things like this. And everybody says, and then, yeah, then they loved it. So we watched some of the old shows. So now there's kids watching black and white TV who, who, who were, were never going to watch it. So, I mean, I, I, I think that's good. You had you made a point earlier, and I'm such an idiot because I wanted to say that's that's you said something that was so smart. I'm going to keep thinking about it as we move on. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, it's just an odd. <clears throat> oh, when you were talking about songs, mm. um, so think of this. Yes, but we've listened to. The magic is the songs that are most recorded are Christmas songs. Mm. And so we've all, you know, Irving Berlin wrote White Christmas, and I think it was initially sung by someone else. Then Bing Crosby sang it. Then that's how we knew it. Then Johnny Mathis sang it. Then Neil Diamond sang it. And, you know, you're, <clears throat> you're hearing the same lyrics interpreted by a different artist. And and you know we I buy those albums like when we were, we grew up with Johnny Mathis singing Christmas it and that's what you listen to Christmas Day. The thing is we didn't do the same dialogue we didn't do the same scenes. Rob was so ingenious to create an entirely new kind of world for us that we we did not have the we did not have to shoulder the burden of like recreating the monsters mm. like when they did here in the states one of the greatest shows of my youth was the odd cup and then they did the black odd cup and they got two great actors ron class and damon wilson and they gave them the same scripts that they gave tony randall and jack lundman with very little change and it was hard to watch them do the stuff that was so well done by the other guys when with two great actors, they should have just written all new scripts for that. Mm. You know, it's interesting, I, isn't it? Because I think I've always mentioned, I'm sure I've mentioned on this show before the fact that when I was at drama school, I remember watching funnily enough, the complete reverse of what you're describing the in perhaps when we did a class, an exercise class, Splitting into couples, you've got the same piece. It's a Neil uh, Neil Simon piece. Um, it's just two pages from a stage play, and everybody's was absolutely different. It was all, it was like watching different plays. It was exactly the same script. It was the same words, but because people are different, they bring in something else. They bring a different experience to. Exactly that's the, the genius. That's the genius of the theater, isn't mm. it? Because yes. you have no way to record the other performance. Mm. So, like I'm saying, in the Odd Couple, we saw Tony and Jack do the jokes a hundred times mm. by the time they put on the Black Odd Couple. And I mean, you think, isn't it funny <laughs> to call it the Black Odd Couple instead of the New Odd Couple? Actually, now that I'm thinking of it, maybe it wasn't. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was a new odd couple. Hopefully it wasn't the black odd couple. I can't remember. I just can't. I'm sorry. I simply can't remember. Yeah, but, but in the theater, mm -hmm. yes, you play Hamlet, and then the guy, your roommate, plays Hamlet, 
And you guys have two completely different Hamlets. Yeah. The joy is, as a theater goer, do you get to see all the Hamlets? Mm. And some are good because they're good because they connect with you. And some don't connect with you. And it doesn't mean the actor's not good. It just means their take on the their Hamlet, you didn't you didn't dig. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Were you were you concerned by the fact that it didn't get a theatrical release and it went straight to Netflix? I wasn't, you know, they they kind of uh alerted us to that a couple months earlier. So I knew that that was the case. They didn't tell us while we were shooting. Um I didn't I mean Netflix in the states you know 80 million people can watch the movie in one night in the world you know 200 million people could watch it mm. I mean I, has it played England yet it hasn't I was checking I was hoping to actually get to see it before we could talk it's not released in the UK yet either physically or on streaming I believe the collect it's it's weird yeah I mean I can order a DVD or Blu-ray from the states, but they you have to have the all really, region. Yeah, it's not. So they haven't done a. Um, they haven't done the stri the streaming platform. So it, it, we're usually a month or so behind the states. So maybe it's good. Yeah. yeah, Canada just got it because uh, yeah. I was just up in Canada, and a lot of those folks were very happy to have just been able to watch it. Yeah, um, yeah no, that didn't bother. That didn't bother me. Look, it's the way. The, the new Hellraisers debuts on Hulu. It's just oh, yeah. the way. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Now I understand from uh, our, our mutual friend Chris that you, your, um, when you go to conventions, you do have quite a bit of Munsters memorabilia or Men Munsters stuff on your stand. Is there a particular Munsters item that's selling particularly well? Uh, people have liked these, so. Uh, the 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 merchandise is coming out from NECA soon, uh, but as a collector, uh, I I buy dolls from a, a company called Brent's Toys for Sale, and they make these magical like one of a kind uh, pieces of art that look like a doll, but really it's like a painting on the wall because everyone's painted differently, everyone's hand painted. They're not professionally made and they can't they're not made in any kind of factory setting so they're like these art pieces uh and so i've been i've been i have those at the table if people want them um i think i'll have some i'm doing a streamerly signing event on december 2nd i think and we might have some of them available there i wish i had one here to show you but most of my stuff is up in the other in the other house right. um but they're fun. It's like a doll yeah. of Grandpa Herman, uh, the, whomever, you right. know. Right. So people, people like those. It's been interesting for me, you know. Like the, I've been going to the shows as a fan for thirty-five years, as long as they've existed. So now to go and sit at the table, uh, I thought I want to have the greatest monsters display ever. I'm looking to see if I have. Um, anything here they people should go to my page i don't i'm looking if there's anything over um but uh we have a lot of uh one man riot did a beautiful limited edition um like black light poster that's velvet black light like from when we were kids you know and yeah you'd yeah get, i remember you get at the carnival or whatever so we got a lot of fun of uh, fun stuff and people can always reach out on Facebook to me, or they can look toward this streamerly event. I wish that I'm, I think I'm saying that right. And that'll be on December 3rd, where people all over the world, I can sign stuff for them. Some new thing. Oh, okay. Have you ever done that? I've no, I've not heard of this. I've not heard right. of Well, I'll, I'll see how it goes. I might send them, send them, I'll stick them on you. <laughs> Would it be nice to sign stuff for people all over the world? Oh God. Yeah. 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 I enjoy signing stuff for people. Um, now, have you heard, of, uh, we talked about mixed reactions to the film, but has there been any mention of a possibility of a follow-up? Oh, gosh, wouldn't that be so great? I mean, I've mentioned it. Uh, everybody we talk to who loves the movies says, please tell us there's another one. 
because it's it's very open ended. I mean, on right. purpose, right? Very open ended. Um, so wouldn't that be great if that were the case? Yeah, um, yeah. that would be great. Yeah, and and we'll see. Um, I guess it's got to make money, and Rob has to want to do it. Sherry and Jeff, I I'm in. You know, so so much for my negotiating ability. I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They first told me when he told me I was doing it, and then you know they mentioned the first number in the negotiation. I was like, all right, um, I guess that's fine, but it's going to take me a while to get the money together. And they said, no, we're going to pay you. I was like, oh, 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 you're gonna, I thought you were, I thought you wanted me to pay you. Because I would. Yeah, actors like this, we're, we're nightmares for our agents when we do things. Oh, like no, this. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Chris Rowe, shut up, shut up. Stop saying that. <laughs> it's just like, what do you mean you're doing it for a friend? Yeah, all right. <laughs> You know what I have? Isn't it funny? I have a, a um, we we share our friend Chris Rowe, uh, who's Chris Rowe Management, an amazing guy, mm -hmm. who uh, has actors and one um, convention people. He does all that. Uh, I've been with the same manager, uh, a husband and wife team. The husband first since nineteen. This is going to blow your mind. Since nineteen eighty five. Wow. I went with the manager. And then he became such a successful um, film writer and producer uh, that he said, you know, just go with my wife. And I knew she was a manager. So I've been with them. Now that's nearly 40 years with this team of people. Uh, isn't that incredible in my wow. career? That so when people call Leslie and say, Leslie Rice, and they say, well, Dan's my friend. She goes, go, stop right there. That's great. So since he's your friend and you want him to be happy, I'm assuming you want to pay him what he's worth and not some lower fee because you know him. You're gonna you know that he's got kids and wives and houses. And so she he like gets right in there. But when it is friends, you know, Nick, I always say, you know how sharks have three sets of teeth? Yeah. Take two of the sets out and just just go with one set of teeth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, I understand you had a private jet experience during the filming. Of oh, yes. Smell me. Um, <laughs> so because that's thanks to COVID. Uh, that's thanks to COVID. Uh, they had to fly us to keep our bubble tight. They had to fly us in a private jet. We got on it in, in Van Nuys. Then we went to... Um, picked up Rob and Sherry in Connecticut. And then we went to Budapest and, and that was, and like you get in a plane and then you get out of a plane in another country the next morning. It's crazy. Hey, could we just take a moment? Of course. Uh, I see, uh, Julia, did you bring your art by the way? Uh, Do you have one handy? I no. can, I, I don't. I, okay. So, so this is, this is a unique experience I wanted to have. Because this is you got to sneak oh, home. Oh, this is yeah. and we don't and we don't curse because oh. it's the internet and we don't curse anyway, Julia. Right? <laughs> so shake. I, 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 I assume this is for adults. Process. This is not made for children. I oh, all right. Here, cause cause necessary. Sure. <laughs> this is this is my stepdaughter Julia Peralta, uh, and uh, you're. I just wanted to bring her on. So that's my friend. Uh, the chatterer, yeah, yeah, Nick, Nicholas Benz, yeah, I know, right. But so, uh, you when did you discover just and you discover Hellraiser? Uh, it was last year in October, I want to say, yeah. And what was your initial reaction? Um, oh god, I loved it. Um, it was. See, I I first I knew about the movie itself because um I played Dead by Daylight and they added um I see yeah, you're like mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um uh, they added Pinhead and the Chatter as an alternate costume and I had like both of them because 
you know, it's great. Could you never thought you'd be talking to the guy? No, I mean, like, I've, like there's like parts of me that are like, maybe someday I'll do it. Maybe someday I'll, you know, end up like at a convention and he'll be there. And I go like, hello, Mr. Vince, I'm a big fan. I, I have this thing for you. But, but the, see, the thing is, these this family that I married into, my, my stepdaughter here is a great artist. Uh, she drew a funny thing. We we got to get you a copy of it. You have it there. Have it's it. like it's like as if all the murderers did a selfie, like when they all take. So we've actually had this on our tables at shows, and we've had. Uh, I think you've had. We've gotten everybody to sign it except Robert England, haven't we? Um, we'll find it first. We're missing also one of the ghost faces, like Matthew Lillard or. Um, um, all right. I'm forgetting this. I wish I knew that. But uh, she, she's looking for it. But he's it's such a lovely man. Yeah. Matt um, is such a great guy. Oh, I'm I'm sure. It's so funny, though, uh, what I was saying, like this, you know, her mother loves Star Wars. Um, and, you know, that all of a sudden she's married to a guy who's in Star Wars, you know, was, I don't think, uh, on her plan. And that this kid loves all this stuff. And she ends up in the family yeah. of the one guy who knows who's the connection to all of you gen genius actors. <laughs> Come on, Julia. I'm trying to find How it. How much artwork do you have? Well, it's not, I mean, I have a lot. I draw Good. a lot. Good. Good. All right. Well, do you have any other questions? You, you um, I mostly wanted to ask, like, mm. um, well, how was the makeup process for putting on like all the uh, sort of like body mutilation for the chatter? Like how, like what was the sort of preparation that you need to do? Because I noticed that like, you know, you, his eyes are sort of like gashed over and I'm mm. sort of curious mm. of how you sort of acted with that. Like, I don't know if there's actually like some way that you can see or are you like having to do like be guided by like people? Is there like sort of um, noises that you need to be aware of and be very s spatially okay. aware? Okay, yes. All right. There's a lot of questions in there. Let me- you know, sorry, sorry. Try to keep no, the no, questions that's fine. to a minimum. That's we have a, it's a chattering hour. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. We've got time. We've got time. Um, I don't often talk about this on this on this channel. So know, isn't um, it nice to you should be interviewed. I got to start a podcast well, I get, so I, I can talk to you. I, I get interviewed. I was at the I have to say I was at the National Film Theatre in London last weekend with Simon Bamford doing a and a in the main cinema at the National Film Theatre. I was so chuffed. This was last weekend at the British Film Institute. Um, well, they, well, well, they, they, which, so oh, you're, was, I know. I, what film were they showing? They they showed Nightbreed and then oh, they Nightbreed. showed Hellraiser. Oh, so I was right. there with I'm Simon, sorry. You got Simon. an award for that, right? Say again? You got an award for that, right? Me personally for those? No. No? Okay. I thought no. I read something I, where, like, I know you went, but I thought. Are you stalking my buddy? No, you. <laughs> this is creepy. <laughs> All right. Let him answer the question. There's only 16 minutes left of the chattering hour. <laughs> Let me answer your question. I do have awards. I got lovely awards in Texas Fright Bear and other awards. Um, so we, to get into the chatterer, okay, it was. It's was actually fairly straightforward for me. All they had to do was to put in the teeth, which were replicas of my teeth that sat outside my mouth. Those were had all done with a thing called denti grip, the stuff that you hold dentures with. Um, so there were those. Then they put a mask on. So the mask that you see is literally one, ma a single mask with the slit down the back. So that just went over my face uh, to answer the question. Could I see much? No, not at all. It was like looking through that, really. Oh. It was tiny. And yes, I was led around by the hand. And no, I couldn't hear. I really it's like having your hands over your ears all the time so you can hear a bit that's interesting but you've got the sound of the rushing waves in yeah you know like when you put the um uh the seashell to your ear you can yeah. ju really just hear the um rushing of the waves so it it's was like when they do a face cast then yeah. you can't 
you literally can't hear anything. No, no. And you, you, are you they, okay with those? You must have you must have had those. I've done so many of them. I don't have any problem with it. No. I kind no. of zen out. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I I was lucky I didn't have any problem with that. So but but in 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 I but in in the net in uh the second one where you had the Nightbreed. Yeah. Nightbreed. That was a heck of a makeup. Oh yeah, that was five hours. That was five yeah. hours you, together. You, yeah. Like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I don't know I what mean, to say. He's like that. That's where he got that beard. <laughs> Moonface guy. Yeah. Kinski. Yeah. But there again, as I say, the kudos has, I'm sure you'll agree, Daniel, the kudos really goes to the makeup artists. All yes. I had to do was to sit in my chair and stay awake for five hours and stay, and stay still. For five hours, I wasn't allowed to fall asleep because then it would pull the makeup. <laughs> so you have to sit still. You're not really allowed to talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> until they, when they're doing the upper part, you can talk to them. We can chat to them. But the moment they start putting on the lower part of the face, you're not allowed to talk after that. Mm -hmm. Once they've got that, you're not allowed to eat. You can drink through a straw. Um, but, you know, I'm sitting in the chair. They're on their feet for five hours. Right. And it's like four o'clock in the morning when they start. They've driven themselves there. So, uh, yeah, that, that's that's the tough. I think they have the toughest part of the deal, really. I, I agree 100 percent. On the monsters we had, um, I had two beautiful women named Rita. Uh, and they had they were stuck wearing these like they had to wear space helmets because of the COVID restrictions. And so they had to look, they'd have to look through the helmet, um, you know, through a mask. Yeah, yeah. In the, in the helmet. With the visor? I mean, it was just, it was just kind of horrible. Um, uh, I know Julia found her, um, her picture. Um, I see if I have, and then I would wear, here's, here's, imagine, like oh, those wow. women had to, I mean, ridiculous. Wow. wow. Yes. For those uh, on, the, on the podcast, they really are complete proper helmets. It's not just face masks. These are proper. Yeah. It was, it was awful. I'd yeah. have them do my ears first. You can see how my ears are blue. Yeah. Then I put in the, the headphones. So uh, then I would sit there for, um, you know, whatever, three hours. Here's Julia's uh, selfie, selfie pic. Oh wow! So she drew that. <laughs> That's maybe great. you gotta I do. Like, you gotta, I like. Yeah, I like I, the cartoon style. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I I like drawing the caricatures of the horror icons. I, Pinhead's my favorite to draw, mostly because of his nose. I think it's just like a really good sort of exercise to get me into um, not having the same sort of same face syndrome with all characters like all of them are very expressive in different like shapes and sizes and so it's just really fun to draw them over and over again yeah and you're you made you've made leatherface 10 times more expressive than he is in the movie yeah uh did you have any uh, do you have any other questions from mr nicholas uh i mean like i could have like a thousand questions at the ready but like you know other than, like, I just think this was, like, a great opportunity for me to meet you, and I'm, like, you know, thankful that you were okay with doing this, and, and I hope that, you know, maybe there's, like, another day where we get to chat in a more, you know, longer social sure. setting. Okay. Cool. Well, well sure. we're going to know each other forever. Yeah. For better, for worse. Yeah. Nicholas, like, that sounds like a threat. I'm alerting the authorities. Um, uh, we'll, we'll all, I know we'll all be together one day. And maybe, maybe we'll you draw a picture. We'll do, we'll do conventions. We'll do conventions. Yeah. We'll, conventions. Yeah. we'll insist yeah. on it. Yes, absolutely. We'll get Mr. Rowe to sort it out. Yes. Yeah. Um, sort it out. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Okay. And thank, thank you. you. Thank She's you very such a much. Great kid. Such thank a you. talented kid. I love you. Love you too. He's a great kid. All right. The move over. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting kicked out now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Julia, that's how it is. Welcome, welcome to show business. You're fired. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah, that was that was like when they Julia, that's like when they bring they bring into uh uh Betty Davis and uh um, oh god, it's like you know when they pose the kids at Christmas. Oh yeah, yeah. You know with the with the awful actresses. Yes. Uh, and you know the kids would be like, "Oh Christmas, shut up." 
Remember that in in uh, the movie, then they no wire hangers and then yeah, they, no, oh good god, yes, that, no, I know exactly what you, uh, mommy dear it, mommy, mommy dear. dear it. And then she'd say, she'd say, don't touch the presents, we're giving them away. Yes, that's what you just had, Julia. She was never, like she was never cut out to be a mother. I don't think that was never, yeah, that was never going to be the right. I'm, I'm a pretty good dad, and I've I've actually inherited two other kids in at this point in my life, so I like I like. Uh, having kids, not when they make noise, though, while I'm on a, a national, international podcast. Whatever you're doing can wait. Thank you, Julia. Uh, 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 I, that's right. I had exactly the same conversation with Craig before we started saying, when are you finishing, when are you finishing drilling? When are you finishing drilling into the walls? I know you've got to get the code, I guess, but when are you finishing? He had finished in plenty of time. Now, before I let you go, there was one thing I wanted to talk to you about. You've been doing, you've been awfully busy since the last couple of years, apart from the Munsters. My goodness, looking at your IMDb, and it's just looking, everything is in post-production. It's 258 uh, on IMDb credits at the moment. And still- And, and it's funny, you know, like that doesn't really, that doesn't, you know, because it's one credit is Matlock, but there's 56 Matlocks. Yes. One credit's lost, but there's 15 more. So- yeah. It's been a good, yeah, good life and busy lately, busier lately <clears throat> than I thought I'd be allowed to be. Because um, I just, you know, it wanes for us, doesn't it, mm. uh, Nicholas? Yeah. Um, and I, uh, you know, when I've made this decision to kind of create, um, it's really led to a lot of great things. Now we've done three movies on our own and now I'm also being hired to uh, direct movies for other people, um, which is kind of what I've been hoping for. Right. Um, and to write movies uh, for other people. Um, so that's, that's a real blessing, but there is, it is funny that I'm in Florida. A miracle has happened. I'm actually shooting a movie called the uncivil war here in Tampa. I sleep in my bed. I get up and I go to work. And we're also picking up some recording for uh, another project that I, so I go to a studio on Monday, I record for this thing that's so big and fun, but I can't talk about it. And then on Tuesday I go do the uncivil war. Uh, so even in my, even in my new adopted town, I'm busy uh, and I'm rewriting another script. So we're, we're on top of things. Brilliant. Brilliant. You mentioned uh, one of your projects earlier on before we started chatting the Hail Mary. Oh, yeah, yeah. How's how's that going? Well, the Hail Mary is going to be I I personally think it's it's it's. I love getting grace. And then we had this miracle film with Lucky Louie that I wrote and directed with my my daughter, Grace, um, which would have existed if there was no COVID because we were going to make the Hail Mary. And then COVID hit and the monsters got pushed and we decided, well, let's make something. So we made uh, Lucky Louie. That'll be out in the spring. The Hail Mary is about a, a fun, brilliant nun comes across this loser who needs redemption. So to lead him toward his redemption, she cons him into creating a football team for her all boys Catholic school. Uh, and it's the story of the guy's, it's not just his redemption, but it's his reconnection to the world. He's he's outside the world, living outside the world, a drunk. Uh, and uh, he has to learn what it's like to be a man and a father and a coach. Uh, and there's something in his past that he's running from. So in the course of the movie, you know, he's he doesn't he has he she literally cons him into doing it. Uh, and once he's coaching, then there's a, a girl shows up at the all boys school. Uh, and uh, this may be an odd character for uh, a faith based film. But uh, if we don't adjust. If we don't really hear what Christ said about everything, then we are not living a full Christian life. And he was very clear about all of these issues, despite what anybody says. His clarity was, we must love everyone. We must not judge anyone. If he said anything more than 10 times, he said those things. So 
I'm not a biblical scholar, but I know he said a lot. So that's a perfectly a great place in our movie to say, to remind people that we must love. Love. That's all that's required of us. Love. And it's not as a father of two of my own and two others, you know, they're daunting sometimes, mm. but one must love them no matter what. That's that's just how it is. Yeah. You have to tough love them, love them in some way. Anyway, so um, I'm so excited for people to see it. I I was, um, I have two great parents, but the Catholic schools that I went to and the nuns who interacted throughout the entirety of my education are, I've never had more support than like the Sisters of St. Joseph. Uh, so, uh, and my parents too, but I'm saying externally, in whatever I did, however I was creative, however uh, I was an artist, it was always the nuns who supported that. So this is my love letter to them. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. Cool. All right. Then. Yeah. I can't wait for the world to see it. Well, that sounds really exciting. I, I really enjoyed Guys and Grace. So I really oh, look thank forward you. to it. And, and I look forward to both that and Lucky Louie. Thank you so much. This is so much fun to come. I love to we talk. It's like, you know, it's a different experience talking to another actor. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, this is one of, one of the, the great joys of doing this program. It's because obviously particularly over the last couple of years, haven't got to speak to an awful lot of actors. And then when you're on set, you don't often get to sit down. I did fully enough. Chat just and chat. I, did. I just, just have a sit down and chat and find out how people are doing and what they're up to and what, you know, what's been going on in their life. That just kind of doesn't often happen on set because even if you are waiting to be called, you're kind of thinking about what's going to be going yeah, on. Yeah, and you, and, and you don't know what the other actors process is. Yeah. It was always what, what I miss most about all of this is how we would get to check in with each other at auditions. Uh, Cause you know, you'd audition and you'd see the actor that you worked with some other time or whatever. Um, and because we haven't been auditioning in person for now nearly three years, mm. um, I was watching, they're showing this uh, mini series here called Dahmer uh, about Jeffrey Dahmer. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. on Netflix. And I've been enjoying that I'm like, there's Raphael Sparge, there's Ari Gross, there's David Bow, these guys that I would always see at auditions, and we're lifers. We've all been there since 1984. Uh, so I actually sent one of the guys a text last night that said, "Geez, I'm so I'm just so glad to see see you in there because we never get to see each other anymore." Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's neat, but. Yeah. You know, God is good. Life is good. Nicholas, we're going to go on. Can I just tell, this is from Waxworks, the, this oh. this amazing album that uh, Rob Zombie put put out with Waxworks. And it has, it has the most extraordinary booklet in it filled with hundreds and hundreds of, like, genius photos of um, making the making of the monsters. Yeah, yeah. People can find it at Waxworks Records on promote. Look at this. Look at this. I don't even know that I pulled that out. There's our, our wedding picture. <laughs> One of these albums, someone told me, I'm just looking because it's this. Is. Yeah, look at that. Even, yeah, even the album has a drawing of the count. Yeah, there I am. It's just too, too cool for school. Yeah. I'm so blessed. Yeah, absolutely. I'm Waxworks. I I think they did a Hellraiser album at one stage. Well, they probably did. They're so yeah. smart. Yeah. And that that uh, you know that they're they're pouring psychedelic wax. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. too cool. It's very very exciting. All right, then, sir. I shall let you get on with the rest of your day. And well, God bless you. Thank you, my friend. You too. Take care of yourself, Dan. And the best, the best to everybody there in your life, and to everybody watching. Thank you. Uh, stay safe. And and remember, love is the only thing required. My thanks again to Daniel and Julia, and my thanks to you for either watching or listening. 
Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great guests from the world of horror, thriller and suspense. And hopefully you'll join me on the next episode in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, stay safe and well. Thank you.